Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Maddie, but today's video is on the brutal murder of Michelle Martinko. Before we start this video, I just want to say that I mean no harm or disrespect to anyone that I talk about in today's video. I'm just making this video to shed light and bring awareness to this case that took 40 years to solve. If you want, you can subscribe down below and follow me on my social medias. Also, I just made channel memberships, so if you'd like to join, there's a join button down below where you get special perks. Okay, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So, Michelle Martinko was born on October 6th, 1961 to the par her parents, Albert and Jeanette Martinko. Michelle was the youngest of two daughters, so she had one older sister. Michelle attended Cedar Rapids Kennedy High School, where she was an above average and very talented student. She was in choir, theater productions, and the twirling squad. Um, and she was overall a pretty popular girl. She didn't have a lot of close girlfriends due to, I guess, people say the jealousy that girls had towards her because she was so stylish and gorgeous. She was a gorgeous young girl who was just 18 when she was murdered. Michelle had plans to attend Iowa State University to study interior design after she graduated high school. The night of Michelle's murder was December 19th, 1979. On the evening of December 19th, Michelle had left her home to go to a choir banquet. Um, and afterwards, she was supposed to go to Westdale Mall to look at this fur coat I think that her mom wanted to get her for Christmas in a couple days, but she wanted to make sure she liked it because she didn't want to get Michelle anything she wouldn't like. The night of Michelle's murder, she was wearing a black dress, black tights, black scarf, heels, and a brown leather purse. After the choir banquet, Michelle asked one of her friends if they wanted to go to the mall with her just to like look at the coat, try it on, but they said no, so Michelle went alone. She arrived at around 7, 7.30 and didn't call her mom until 8.45 after she had been shopping around for a while and she asked her mom for directions to the store. She had no idea what store she was headed to and she just wanted to ask her mom where she was going. So after Michelle and her mom ended the phone call. That would be the last time that Michelle's family ever spoke to her. So the mall closed at around 10 p.m. And by the time 11 p.m. rolled around, the Martinkos were really concerned about where Michelle was. You know, she wouldn't just be out without telling them where she was for an hour after the mall was closed. Michelle's father immediately headed out and went to a bunch of locations that um, the high schoolers would hang out and stuff and started asking, had anyone seen Michelle? Did anyone know where she was? Nobody could find her. Her family immediately was extremely suspicious and they kind of had a feeling that something was wrong. So they immediately reported her as a missing person to the Cedar Rapids police station. By 2 a.m., Michelle still hadn't arrived home. Like She just wasn't there. Her family was so concerned. And that's when the police headed out and started, started a search party. The police began searching and immediately headed towards the mall where one officer was going through the empty parking lot, seemingly empty parking lot of the mall when they saw a green and tan Buick Parked alone, no other cars in the parking lot, a little bit further from the mall, with the windows frosted. So immediately, he knew this was the Martinko's Buick, and he walked over to the frosted doors and opened the driver's side door to it 
being unlocked. It wasn't locked, it wasn't like she had left her car here and was like hanging out with friends, someone picked her up from here, whatever. He opened the car door to find Michelle's body lying inside, slouched over. Officer immediately knew this was a crime scene. Her, there was blood all over the car along with little wispies of the fur coat that she was wearing that night. Not the one that she went to look for in the store, but the one that she was wearing that night. At the crime scene, it was pretty obvious to tell that Michelle was in fact dead. Moments later, detectives arrived and immediately were stunned at the amount of violence and anger that seemed to be in the crime. Like, this seemed pretty personal. It was a pretty aggressive crime. It was confirmed that Michelle had been stabbed 29 times in her face, neck, and chest. And she also had a lot of defensive wounds all over her hands, indicating that she had fought for her life. And she had fought so hard with her attacker. Now, the lack of blood outside of the car indicated that the entire attack had been in the car kind of getting the police to theorize, okay, how did this scene take place? You know what I mean? Now, medical examiners were able to confirm that she had died between 8 and 10 p.m., but we know she was in the mall still at 8.45 when she called her mom, so I'm gonna assume it's closer to 10 p.m. Immediately, it was identified that there was no fingerprints left at the scene, proving that the attacker was wearing gloves and with further investigation it was confirmed that these were rubber gloves you have to think about motive what is the murderer's motive and immediately it was clear that the motive was not robbery or sexual assault because all her money was still in her purse which was later found under her body and there was no signs of sexual assault immediately ruling out those two possible possible motives immediately the community rallied around and supported the martinko family through this tragic loss of their daughter um and investigators began asking the community and it was confirmed that Michelle had no enemies. She was super full of life and super nice to everyone. She was just the type of person that like everyone got along with. Since the family stopped communicating with Michelle at 8.45 p.m. the night of her murder, they needed to use her friends and witnesses at the mall to piece together her night because they had no real timeline of events so students confirmed that they saw michelle parking in the parking lot of the mall at 7 30 p.m that night she was walking around talking and socializing for a while there was actually a lot of people that she knew at the mall that day and at 8 45 she called her mom to ask where the place that the fur coach her mom wanted to get her for Christmas was. So after that, Michelle went into the store, tried on the coat, didn't really like it, and left. Um, she was then continuing to walk around and socialize. Now, this was a new mall, so she continued to walk around and socialize and actually ran into a boy from her choir class. So they had a small conversation and then she walked by a store that one of her old friends, Kurt Thomas, was working at. So they stopped and he was actually getting on his break while she was passing by the store. So they stopped and had like a 30 minute conversation. And then Kurt walked her to the exit of the mall because I guess th this was kind of like him wrapping up the end of his shift after this break and then the mall was going to close. So Michelle wanted to leave, he walked her to the exit and he went back to work. 
Michelle then left the mall before it closed at 10 p.m. And a girl from her school, Cheryl Anders, was walking into the mall as she was leaving the mall. So that was the last known sighting of Michelle. And that's the last confirmed like placing of her, if that makes sense. So the theory that investigators have put together since there wasn't a lot of CCTV footage back then, this was 79, um, which actually really angered the Martinko family because they were really upset that there was no CCTV footage at this mall that could just give us a little bit more information than what we had. The way that investigators believe this panned out was that Michelle put the items that she had just got at the store in the backseat of her car and then opened her driver's side door and was about to start the car when she was blitz attacked before she could like pull out of the parking lot. Um, the attacker opened the car door and entered the car blitz attacking her and leaving her with like a hit on the head which kind of shocked her and like you know she couldn't really fight him off at that point now something that's strange is that the evidence indicates that this was a well thought out plan i mean he had gloves this wasn't just like spur of the moment like he had gloves and weapons and he knew not to leave fingerprints anywhere but there were glove imprints like on the inside and outside of the car which is how they were able to know that he went inside the car um so investigators then collected blood samples found on the scene um but the main question they were asking themselves was who would want to do this to Michelle and why would they want to do it in such a public area? I mean, this was the middle of a mall parking lot. You know what I mean? <laughs> Immediately, her former boyfriend was looked at, her ex-boyfriend was looked at as a main suspect because he happened to be at the mall the same night in which she was murdered her ex-boyfriend andy was the first person of interest the first suspect you could say because anytime there's a murder you immediately look at the family the friends the boyfriend the ex-friends and the ex-boyfriends be or girlfriends but like in this case it's ex-boyfriend because even though it seems like they're like super close with them that could give you a motive, you know what I mean? Being an ex-boyfriend is a pretty solid motive at this point. So Andy had been at the mall and she he actually talked to Michelle that night. He wanted to give her a Christmas gift, which I thought was a little weird, but whatever. And he supposedly called Michelle's mom that night saying that he wanted to give her a gift um, and the family didn't really like Andy he was pretty controlling and um, possessive and like at this point Michelle had moved on from Andy she was seeing other guys she was dating around like the idea of well if I can't have her nobody can became the investigators new motive to look into andy as a suspect family immediately was like yeah he could definitely be her killer because the killer had like stabbed themselves at the scene of the crime because i think there was blood found of the murderer and andy's behavior was extremely strange at the funeral of michelle martinko um, he was wearing long sleeves, seeming as though he was covering a wound, I guess a stab wound. And then when he walked up to the casket of Michelle, he actually fainted, which made the Martinko family extremely suspicious of him and just like 
they really thought he did it. When questioned, Andy said his conversation with Michelle at the mall the night of her murder was completely a coincidence and it had nothing to do with, it had no relevance to her murder. Andy's mom was actually his only alibi because she said he had gotten home and he was chilling at home, which can make you look incredibly suspicious having your parent as an alibi, especially because it was pretty late at this point. Like the parent could have gone to bed and just seen Andy at home at some point and then the mom went to bed and Andy's gone again. You know what I mean? But she would never know. There's actually no physical evidence to link Andy to the crime and put him at the scene of the crime. Therefore, he was no longer a witness because the police had no time to have tunnel vision in this investigation. They needed to find the killer and if there was no evidence, why would they continuously try to pin this on Andy? Next suspect was the mysterious man at the mall the night of Michelle Martinko's murder. This man was seen by multiple witnesses to be extremely suspicious. He was walking around in the parking lot, kind of um, sketching a lot of women out. Women out. Um, however, this stranger wasn't ever identified and I mean, there's nothing linking them to the crime. I guess he was just an incredibly suspicious man. Months later, the next suspect was a person of interest, I guess you could say. So this is a man that had broken into a house in Cedar Rapids and had raped a woman at knife point, which the knife point part really is what got police to think that this could possibly be the same attacker because there was a lot of stab wounds and then this woman was held at knife point so you know they're kind of getting the same weapon idea um and the man actually threatened to kill the woman who he rapes raped he threatened to kill the woman he raped his children. Sorry, I don't know how to word that correctly. Um, and I think this was identified as Dennis McKee, who had committed some pretty serious crimes, and police were really suspicious of him. Dennis denied all involvement of the murder of Michelle Martinko, and there was no physical evidence to actually pin him to the murder so they had to let that suspect go as well so at this point investigators had no real suspects and the case seemed to be put back to square one um the case had hit a cold dead end which just broke michelle's family the Martingo family was really struggling with the idea that someone had so much anger out for their daughter or wanted to do this to their daughter. And Michelle's sister said that her parents were never the same. They were extremely sad all the time. And they sadly passed away um, at the end of the 1980s. So. They will never know who murdered their daughter, which breaks my heart. That's, that's so sad. I honestly cannot imagine. And it's so sad to know that so much time had passed without the real suspect being charged with the murder. So, yeah. 
Five months after the murder of Martinko, a woman who was driving by the night of December 20th, so I guess the early morning of December 20th, um, was driving by the mall in the parking lot looking for her daughter's car because her daughter worked at the mall and she had some car problems. So she was just driving by when she saw, she claimed to have seen two cars in the parking lot. One, which was the Martinko's Buick and one with a, sta a man standing outside of Martinko's driver's side door at around 2 a.m. She wasn't sure if her information would be useful at the time, so she kept it private for five months. <laughs> now, the reason she wasn't sure if this information would be useful is because she knew the murder happened between 10 p.m. and midnight, and she drove by at 2 a.m., so she didn't think it was important, but it actually lines up pretty perfectly with the timeline because I don't think police were called until around 2 a.m., which means the murderer might have just been waiting around with Michelle's dead body because she it was confirmed that she was killed between 8 and 10 p.m. So... They actually almost charged the woman for like not saying anything because it was extremely important information. On June 19th, 1980, police released a composite sketch of their possible suspect um, who they believed killed Michelle Martinko. They formed this composite sketch by the descriptions that two witnesses had come up with when they were under hypnosis. Um, they described a white man in his late teens or early 20s, around six feet tall and weighing 165 to 175 pounds with brown eyes and curly brown hair. Now, in the year after the killing, the number of people interviewed by police reached the hundreds reached the hundreds and up to 30 people were interviewed under hypnosis they even called in a psychic to see if that could help them at all or come up with any new different leads that they could like try out um and as the investigation like started slowing down they put up a ten thousand dollar reward for anyone who had any other information that would lead to police finding the killer now this case hit a cold dead end. I mean, 27 years later. 27 years later, a new cold case investigator started working for the Cedar Rapids Police Department. And they received a tip that connected the case. It didn't connect to like the suspect, but it was um, about the DNA. So, they police discovered what they thought to be the killer's blood while they were reviewing the case files. From this, they were able to build a DNA profile and now the technology was a lot better than it was in the 80s. Um, they were able to find a partial male, male DNA profile on the gear shift of Michelle's car which proves that the murderer was inside of her car. The results were entered into the national DNA database and nothing came out. There were no matches found whatsoever. Now, once no matches were found, more than 125 people's DNA was swapped and tested against this DNA sample, including Michelle's ex which shocked the family to say the least that it came out negative eliminating andy from the from being the murderer which honestly michelle's family did believe that andy had done it but i mean i this was good even though andy's entire life everyone blamed him for the murder 
of his ex-girlfriend. Now, the next idea that police had was to send in the dress that Michelle was wearing, which I don't know why they didn't send it in earlier. I guess because the DNA testing wasn't as good, but they sent in her dress and there was DNA samples all over it. So the timeline is now three decades later. So we are at 39 years since the murder of Michelle Martingo. And investigators were looking for any details that they may have overlooked. And this was when forensic genealogy became a thing, which if you guys don't know who the Golden State Killer is, that's how they found him and got him arrested. It's basically where you take a DNA sample and it actually leads you to other people in the family's DNA so you can narrow it down to find the killer. So they put in a request to have Michelle's case be put into the forensic genealogy thing. They actually found a match. Using the DNA sample, they found, they found on the dress that a second cousin once removed from the killer could be identified. So now they have the second cousin once removed, which is so much closer than they could have ever been in the past. So investigators created a family tree they were trying to narrow it down, this huge family tree. And eventually they were able to cut it down to three brothers who were all alive and who all still lived in Iowa. So this was perfect. They were like, what? They are all still alive, which I mean is pretty shocking. Um, 39 years later, you never know, right? But now they needed to eliminate which of the three brothers was the killer and the way you do this is you have to find dna from them so investigators went undercover to obtain dna samples from each brother now investigators feared that they would actually be like caught from one of the brothers and like one of the brothers would be suspicious that they were like on to them so they were extra careful and they stayed hidden eventually collecting dna from each brother on october 29th 2018 an investigator observed one of the brothers jerry lynn burns drink multiple sodas using plastic straws so once Burns disposed of the straws. They went and collected it and tested it for DNA and it came back positive. The DNA from Jerry Burns' straw matched with the DNA found on Michelle Martinko's dress. Investigators wanted to actually wait a few days to confront Jerry Burns because they wanted to wait till the anniversary of Michelle Martinko's case to trigger some kind of guilt inside of him. So they did. They waited a couple days and they confronted him on December 19th of 2018. During the interview, investigators asked him how his DNA would be found at the crime scene. They were like, how, how was your DNA found at the crime scene? He was like, it wasn't. How would we get your DNA at the crime scene there, Jerry? I don't know, test it, see if it is. No, 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 we did. Like, did you test it? They at, and they were like, yeah, we tested it. He was like, test the DNA. So investigators asked him, did you kill Michelle? And all he could say was test the DNA. Test the DNA. Test the DNA. What happened that night? Wait for the test to come back. Did you murder someone that night, Jerry? Test the DNA. Jerry. Test the DNA. Why did this happen, Jerry? Test what, the DNA. What? He showed no emotion during the interview whatsoever. He was pretty much just like, I don't even, I don't care, you know? And... 
It was confirmed that he didn't know Michelle. He just wanted to kill someone that night, which is disgusting. Now, Jerry would have been 25 when he killed Michelle Martingo in December of 1979. He grew up in Manchester, Iowa, and he graduated from West Delaware High School in 1972. At the time of his arrest, he owned a power coding business. And well, like I said, on December 19th, 2018, exactly 39 years after Michelle Martingo's murder, Burns was arrested and charged with first degree murder. So now we're gonna get into the trial. He entered a plea deal that he was not guilty. He has never confessed to being guilty of the murder. So his trial was originally scheduled for October 14th, 2019. In September of 2019, defense actually asked for a delay in the trial to gather more evidence and witnesses. So the trial was rescheduled for February 10th, 2020, which was pretty recently. After three hours of deliberation, the jury found Jerry Lynn Burns guilty of first degree murder of Michelle Martinko. Burns received a life sentence without the possibility of parole, but on May 29th of 2019, Burns' attorney filed a motion, sorry, I'm reading this so that way I get it right, <laughs> filed a motion asking for a new trial, claiming that his constitutional and state rights were violated and that the court made a mistake in overruling the request for evidence to be suppressed. Which doesn't, eat, like, what? On August 7th, 2020, which literally was a, like, couple weeks ago burns was officially sentenced to a life in prison without the possibility of parole what i don't understand is that burns had like no record of criminal history like that he just wanted to kill someone this day he didn't care who it was and it was such a vicious and brutal attack for no reason and Honestly, my heart goes out to Michelle's friends and family. And I'm so glad that after 39 years, Michelle's case could be solved and can finally get the closure that it deserves. Once again, I mean no harm or disrespect to anyone that I talked about in this video. Yeah, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. You can like and subscribe, and don't forget to comment which case you want me to cover next. I love you all. Please stay safe and healthy. I love you all. Please stay safe and healthy. Um, hopefully, I will see you in my next video. Mwah. Deuces.